Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Jamie, Pandora, and Bella. And as always, I want to remind you to stay safe, healthy, hit that like button, subscribe, a comment below, and hit the notification bell. Today we're getting back into Stephen King's fairy tale. We are going to be on Chapter 12, Christopher Polly, Spilled Gold, Not So Nice Preparations. And without further ado, get, let's get there. Okay, I am back in chapter 12, part one. Let me write something down for a second. Right. Okay, here we are. I can't remember how I felt at that moment. I can remember what I thought, though. Rumpelstiltskin is pointing a gun at the back of my head. What's down there? What? You heard me. You were in that hole a long time. I was starting to think you died. So what's down there? Not another thought came. He can't know. No one can. Pumping machinery it was the first thing that came into my head. Pumping machinery. Pumping machinery. That's what it is. Ha ha. Yes, otherwise everything floods in the backyard when it rains and it runs down the street. Brains kicking into gear. It's old. I was checking to see if I've got to get someone from the city down here to look at it. You know, the water depart. Bull, ha ha. What's really down there? Is there gold down there? No, just machinery. Don't turn around, kiddo. Wouldn't be smart. Not at all. You went down there with a great big gun. Ha ha, to check on a water pump. Rats, I said. My mouth was very dry. I thought there might be rats. Bull story. Total bull. What's that over there? More pumping machinery. Don't move, just look to your right. I looked and saw the moldering corpse of the big cop cockroach Mr. Bodich had shot. There wasn't much left. Even such feeble invention as I'd mentioned so far failed me, so I said I didn't know, and the man I was not I was thinking of as a Rumpelstiltskin didn't really care. He had his eye on the prize. Never mind. Right now, let's check out the old guy's safe. Maybe we'll check out the pumping machinery later in the house, kiddo, and if you make any noise in the way, I'm going to blow your head off. But first, I want you to unbuckle the shoot and iron, bit partner, ha-ha, and drop it. I wanted to bend over, meaning to stay to undo the knots holding the tie-downs. The gun went back against my head and hard. Did I tell you to bend over? I didn't just unbuckle the belt. I unbuckled it. The holster hit my knee and turned over. The gun fell out on the shed floor. Now you can unbuckle you can buckle up again. Nice belt. Ha ha. At this point I'm going to stop most of the ha ha crap because he said it all the time. As a kind of verbal punctuation, just let me add that is extremely rumple still skinnish. Which is to say creepy. Now turn around. I turned and he turned with me. We were like figures in the music box. Slow chappy slow. I walked out of the shed. He walked with me. It had been overcast in the other world, but it was sunny here. I could see our shadows. His, his with one arm outstretched and a shadow gun in his right shadow hand. My brains had managed to get from low gear into second, but I was a long way from third. I had been sandbagged good and proper. We climbed the back porch steps. I unlocked the door, and we went into the kitchen. I remember thinking all the, of all the times I'd been in here never suspecting how soon I'd be entering for the last time because he was going to kill me. Except he couldn't. I couldn't let him. I thought of people finding out about the well of the worlds and knew I wouldn't let him. I thought about city cops or a state police SWAT team or army guys over running the shoe woman's little yard, tearing down her crisscrossing lines and leaving her shoes in the dirt, scaring her. I knew I couldn't let them. <laughs> you know they do that. <laughs> Miserable oops. I thought of those guys tromping into the abandoned city and awakening whatever slept there and knew I couldn't let, let him. Only I couldn't stop him. The joke was on me. Ha ha. Part 2 of Chapter 12. Up the stairs to the second floor we went, me in the lead and Rumpelstiltskin 
behind me. I thought of suddenly lunging backward, halfway, and knocking him the rest of the way down, but didn't try. It might work, but there was a good chance I'd be dead if I, if it didn't. If Radar had been here, he sh she'd have had a go at Rumple, old or not, and wouldn't would likely be dead already. Bedroom, chappy, the one with the safe. I went into Mr. Bowditch's room. Bedroom. You killed Mr. Heinrich, didn't you? What? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. He caught the bloke who did that. I didn't pursue the subject. I knew he knew, and he knew I knew. I knew other things as well. Number one, that if I claimed I didn't know the combination to the safe and persisted in, in that lie, he would kill me. Number two was a variation of number one. Open the closet, kiddo. I opened the closet. The empty holster flapped against my thigh. Some gunslinger I turned out to be. Now open the safe. If I do that, you'll kill me. There was a moment of silence as he digested this self-evident truth. Then he said, no, I won't. I'll just tie you up. Aha. Aha was exactly right because he, how was he going to accomplish that? Mrs. Richland had said he was a little man her height, which meant about 5'4". I was a foot taller and athletes build these days thanks to chores and bike re riding. Tying me up without an accomplice to keep me covered would be impossible. You will? Really? I made my voice tremble, which was, believe me, not a problem. Yes, no, now open the safe. You promise? right Oh, old Beano. Now open it or I'll put a bullet in the back of your knee and you'll never dance the tango again. Ha-ha. Okay, just as long as you really totally promise not to kill me. Already asked and answered as they can say in court. Open the safe. All, along with everything else I had to live for, I couldn't let that lilting voice be the last thing I heard. I just couldn't. Okay. I knelt in front of the safe. I thought he's... He's going to kill me, and I can't let him kill me, and I won't let him kill me because of Radar, because of the shoe woman, because of Mr. Bowditch, who had given me a burden to carry because there was simply no one else. I grew calm. There's quite a bit of gold, I said. I don't know where he got it, but it's awesome sauce. He paid his bills with it for years. Stop talking and open the safe. Then as if he, could, as if he couldn't help himself. How much? Man, I don't know. Maybe a million dollars worth. It's in a bucket that's so heavy I couldn't, can't even lift it. I had no clue how to turn the tables on the little on the little thing. If we had been face to face, maybe. Now the muzzle of a gun less than an inch from the back of my head, but once I got to the varsity level in the sports I played, I'd learned to shut off my brains at a game time and let my body take over. I had to do that now. There was no other option. Sometimes in football games, when we were behind, especially at away games, when where hundreds of people were jeering at us. I'd focus on the opposing quarterbacks and tell myself he was a nasty. And I was going to not just sack him, but flatten him. It didn't work very well unless the guy was a showboat who showed he was a gloat face after a big play, but it worked on this guy. He had a gloat voice, and I had no problem hating him. Quit stalling, old bean, old boss, old bean bag. Open the safe, you'll never walk straight again. Never walk at all was more like it. I turned the combination dial one way than the other, then back the first way again. Three numbers down, one to go. I risked the look over my shoulder and saw a narrow face, a weasel's face almost under a retro white socks ball cap with a high crown and a red circle where the O in socks belong. Can I have at least some? He gave a tittery little laugh. Nasty, open it. Stop looking at me and open it. I turned the combination in the last number. I pulled the handle. I couldn't see him looking over my shoulder, but I could smell him. Sour sweat, the kind that almost baked in, bakes into a person's skin after a long time without bathing. The safe swung open. I didn't hesitate because he, would, he who hesitates is lost. I grabbed the bucket by the rim and overturned it between my spread knees. Gold pellets flooded out and ran across the floor in all directions. At the same time, I dived into the closet. He fired the sound not much louder than a medium sized firecracker. I felt the bullet go between my shoulder and my ear. The hem of one of Mr. Boach's old-fashioned suitcases twitched as the bullet passed through it. Mr. Bowditch had plenty of shoes. Dora would have been envious. I grabbed a brogan, rolled over on my side and threw it. He ducked. I threw the other one. He ducked again, but I hit him on in the chest. He backed up onto the gold pellets, which we were still rolling, and his feet went out from under him. He landed hard with his legs splayed, but held onto his gun. It was a lot, lot smaller than Mr. Bowditch's forty-five revolver, which probably accounted for the low decibel bark. 
I didn't try to get to my feet, just squatted and uncoiled from the thighs on down. I flew over the rolling gold like Superman and landed on top of him. I was big. He was small. The air went out of him with a woof sound. His eyes were bulging. His lips were red and gleaming with spittle. Get off me, it lay but out of breath whisper. As if I grabbed for the hand holding the gun, missed my grip and grabbed again before he could bring it around to my face. The gun, gun went off a second time. I don't know where the bullet went and didn't care because it didn't go into me. His wrist was slippery with sweat, so I clamped down with all my strength and twisted. There was a snap. He uttered a high-pitched scream. The gun fell from his hand and hit the floor. I picked it up and pointed it at him. He made that high-pitched scream again and put his good hand in front of his face as if that would stop a bullet. The other one just flopped on his broken wrist, which was already beginning to swell. No, don't. Please don't shoot me. Please. <coughs> Words from a coward. Not one single ha-ha. Part 3 of Chapter 12 You may have gotten a pretty good feeling about young Charlie Reed by this point, I guess. Sort of like a hero in one of those YA adventure movie novels. I'm the kid who stuck with my father when he was drinking, cleaned up his vomit, prayed for his recovery on his knees, and actually got what he prayed for. I'm the kid who saved an old man when he fell off a ladder trying to clean the gutters. The kid who went to visit him in the hospital and took care of him when he came home. Who fell in love with the old guy's faithful dog and the faithful dog fell in love with him. I strapped on a 45 and braved a dark quarter, not to mention the giant wildlife therein, and came out in another world where I made friends with an old lady who, with a damaged trace who collected shoes. I'm the kid who overpowered Mr. Heinrich's killer by cleverly dumping gold pellets all over the floor so he'd lose his balance and fall down. Gosh, I even played two varsity sports, strong and tall, no acne, perfect, right? Only I was also the kid who put firecrackers in mailboxes, blowing up what might have been somebody's important mail. I was a kid who smeared dog dew on the windshield of Mr. Dowdy's car and squeezed Elmer's glue in the ignition slot of Mr. Kendrick's old Ford wagon when Bertie and I found it unlocked. I pushed over gravestones, I shoplifted. Bertie Bird was with me on all those ex exhibitions, and it was the Birdman who phoned in the bomb threat, but I didn't stop him. There was other, there were other things that I'm not going to tell you about because I'm too ashamed. All I say is that we scared some little kids so bad they cried and peed themselves. Not so nice, right? No. Nope. And I was mad at this little man, his dirty corduroy pants and his Nike warm-up jacket and his clotted greasy hair falling over the brow, brow of his narrow weasel's face. I was mad, of course, because he would have killed me once he had the gold. He'd already killed once, so why not? I was mad because he'd, because if he had killed me, the cops, possibly led by Detective Leeson and his intrepid sidekicks, Officers Whitmark and Cooper, would have entered the shed in the course of their investigations and found something that would have made the murder of Charles McGee Reed look piddling in comparison. I was mad at all, you may not believe this, but I swear it's true, because the little man's intrusion made everything more difficult. Was I supposed to report him to the police? That would lead to the gold being discovered, and that would lead to about z ten zillion questions. It's a good way to get rid of him. That world will blow, right? Even if I picked it all up and put it back in the safe, Mr. Haha -Ha would tell them. Maybe to get some consideration from the district attorney, maybe just out of spite. The solution to my problem was obvious. If he was dead, he couldn't tell anyone anything, assuming Mrs. Richland's ears weren't as sharp as her eyes and the two gunshots really hadn't been very loud, the police wouldn't have to come. I even had a place to hide the body. It didn't die. Part 4 of Chapter 12 Although his hand was still in front of his face, I could see his eyes between his splayed fingers. Splayed fingers. Blue threaded with red and starting to spill tears. He knew what I was thinking of doing. He could see it on my face. No, please, let me go. Or call the police if you have to. Just don't kill me. Like you were going to kill me? I wasn't. I swear to God. I swear on my mother's grave. I swear I wasn't. What's your name? Derek. Derek Shepard. I hit him across the face with his gun. I could tell you I didn't mean to do it or I didn't know I was going to do it until it was done. But those would be lies. I knew all, 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 I knew all right and it felt good. Blood burst from his nose. More trickled down the side of his mouth. You think I've never seen Grey's Anatomy? What's your name? Justin Towns. I hit him again. 
he tried to pull me back, which did him no good. I'm not particularly fast on my feet, but there's nothing wrong with my re reflexes. I'm pretty sure that one broke his nose. Instead of just bloodying it, he screamed, but in a high whisper. You must think I don't know Justin Towns' Earl either. I've even got one of his albums. You have one more chance than I put a bullet in your head. Polly said his nose was swelling. The whole side of his face was swelling. And he sounded like he had a bad cold. Chris, Polly, throw me a wallet. I don't have a... He saw me draw back and put out the good hand again. I had plans for that hand, which will probably take me down even further in your estimation. But you have to remember, I was in a fix. Also, I was thinking again of Rumpelstiltskin. Maybe I couldn't eat, make this make this stick his foot in the ground and tear himself in two, but I might be able to make him run away like the gingerbread man. Ha ha. Okay, okay. He got up and reached into the back pocket of his cords, which weren't just dirty, they were filthy. The warm-up jacket had a torn sleeve and ragged cuffs. Wherever this guy was staying, it wasn't the Hilton. The wallet was beat up and scuffed. I flipped it open long enough to see a single ten in the bill from the driver's license with the name Christopher Polly showed a picture of him as a younger man with an intact face. I flipped it closer. I flipped it closed and put it in my back pocket with my own wallet. Looks like your license expired in 2008. You might want to renew it if you live long enough, that is. I can't. His mouth snapped back closed. Can't renew it? Had it jerked? OUI or prison? Have you been in prison? Is that why it took you so long to rob and kill Mr. Heinrich? Because you, you were in Stateville? Not there. Where? He kept silent, and I decided that I didn't care, as Mr. Bowditch might have said it wasn't germane. How did you know about the gold? I saw some in the Kraut store before I did my bit in county. I could have asked how he found out who the gold came from and how he set up the vagrant Dwyer, but I was pretty sure I, bo I knew both of those things. Let me go. I'll never bother you again. No, you won't, because you'll be in jail and not just county jail. I'm calling the cops on you, Polly. You were going away for murder, so let's hear you ha-ha about that. I'll tell. I'll tell about the gold. You won't get any. Well, I would. Actually, according to the will, it was mine, but he didn't know that. That's true, I said. Thanks for pointing it out. I'll have to put you in the pumping machine machinery after all. Lucky for me, you're a little... little guy. I won't strain my back. I raised the gun. I could tell you it was a bluff, but I'm not sure it was. I also hated him for tearing up uh, Mr. Bodich's house for defiling it, and as I believe I've said, killing him would simplify everything. He didn't scream. I don't think he had air enough, but he moaned. The crotch of his pants darkened. I lowered the gun a little. Suppose I told you you could live, Mr. Polly. Not only live, but go your own way. Like the song says, would that interest you? Yes, yes, let me go. I'll never bother you again. Spoken like a true rumple skill stillskin, I thought. How did you get there? Here, did you walk, take the bus as far as Dearborn Avenue? Given the single ten in this billfold, I doubted if he'd taken the Uber. <laughs> he could have cleaned out Mr. Heinrich's back room. The stuff planted on Dwyer made that seemed like likely. But if so, he hadn't uh, converted any of his stash into cash. Maybe he didn't know how. He might be crafty, but he that wasn't necessarily the same thing as being smart or connected. I came through the woods, he gestured with his good hand in the direction of the green belt behind Mr. Bowditch's property, all that remained of the century woods that had covered this part of town a century ago. I reappraised his filthy pants and torn jacket. Mrs. Richland hadn't said the little man's corduroys were dirty, dirty, and she would have. Her eyes were sharp, but she had seen him days ago. My guess was that he hadn't just come to the woods. He was living in them, somewhere not far from the fence at the rear of Mr. Bowditch's yard. There were... Probably a piece of scavenged tarp serving as a shelter with this man's few possessions inside. Any swag from Mr. Heinrich's store would be buried close by, the way storybook pirates did it. Only storybook pirates buried their double wounds and pieces of eight, eight in chests. Polly's was more likely in a satchel with a sticker on it saying, Subscription Service of America. If I was right, his camp would have been close enough to keep an eye out for one Charles Reed. He'd know what who I was from Heinrich. He could have seen me on my trip to Stantonville, and after Polly's search of the house, and added nothing but an unopenable safe, 
he had just waited for me, assuming I would come for the gold, because it's what he would do. Get up. We're going downstairs. Watch out for the gold, BBs, unless you want to take another spill. Can I have a few? Just a few? I'm broke, man. And do what? Use one to pay for lunch at McDonald's? I know a man in Chai. He won't give me what they're worth, but you can have three, five, trying to smile like he'd been planning to kill me once the safe was open. Four. He bent and picked them up quickly with his good hand and went to stuff them in his pants pocket. That's five. Drop one. He gave me a narrow, angry look, a rumpled still skin look, and dropped one. It rolled. You're a mean kid. Coming from St. Christopher of the Woods? That fills me with shame. He looked his... He lifted his lips, showing yellow and teeth. You. I raised his gun, which I thought was a twenty-two automatic. You should never say you to someone with a firearm. Not wise. Ha ha. Now go downstairs. He left the room, cradling his broken wrist to his chest and squeezing the gold pellets in his good hand. I followed. We went through the living room and into the kitchen. He, dropped, he stopped at the door. Keep going. Cross the backyard. He turned to look at me, eyes wide and mouth trembling. You're going to kill me and put me down that hole. I wouldn't have given you any of the gold if I was going to do that, I said. You'll take it back? You'll take it back, he was starting to cry again. You'll take it back and put me down in the hole. Shook my head. There's a fence and you've got a broken wrist. You won't get over it without help. I'll manage. I don't want your help. Walk, I said. He walked crying, sure he was going to be shot in the back of his the head. Because, again, it was what he would do. He only stopped blubbering when... He passed the open door of the shed and found himself still alive. We came to the fence, which was about five feet high, tall enough to keep radar in when he, she had been younger. I don't want to see you again. You won't. Not, not ever. You won't. I promise. Shake on it. <laughs> People like that don't uh, go by there. I stuck out my hand. He took it. Crafty, but not all that smart, like I said. I twisted his hand and had the crack of splintering bones. He shrieked and went to his knees with both hands held to his chest. I stuffed the twenty two in the back of my pants like a bad guy in a movie. Bent grabbed him and lifted. It was easy. He could have he couldn't have weighed more than a hundred and forty, and at that point I was so jacked on adrenaline it was practically shooting out my ears. I threw him over the fence. He landed on his back in a pile of dead leaves and broken branches, gasping little cries of pain. His hand flopped. Uselessly, I leaned over the fence like a washerwoman in a story, eager for the latest village gossip. Go, Polly, run away and never come back. You broke my hand. You broke my... You're lucky I didn't kill you, I shouted at him. I wanted to. I almost did. And if I ever see you again, I will. Now go, while you still have the chance. He gave me one more look. Blue eyes, wide, swelling face smeared with snot and tears. Then he turned and blundered into the poor second growth that was all that remained of the sentry woods broken hands held to his chest. I watched him go without the slightest regret for what I had done. Not very nice. Would he come back? Not with two broken wrists, he wouldn't. Would he tell someone else, a friend or a partner in crime? I didn't think Polly had any partners or friends. Would he go to the cops, given what I knew about Heinrich? The idea was ludicrous. All that aside, I simply couldn't bring myself to kill him in cold blood. I went back inside and picked up the gold pellets. They were everywhere, and it took longer than the whole confrontation with Polly. I put them in the safe along with the empty concho belt and holstered and left. I made sure to untuck my shoe shirt so it hung over the gun stuffed in my pants at the small of my back. But I was still glad Mrs. Richland wasn't out at the end of the driveway with her hand shielding her sharp eyes. Part 5 of Chapter 12 I walked back, back down the hill slowly because my legs were trembling. My mind was trembling. I was climbing my own front porch steps before realizing that I was also hungry. Ravitous, in fact. Radar was taking, was waiting to greet me, but not in the frantic way I expected. Just a happy wag, a few bounces, and a head, head rub against my thigh before heading back to her rug. Excuse me. I realized I'd expected frantic. I'd expected frantic because it felt like I'd been gone a long time. Reality had been less than three hours. A lot had happened in those hours, like life-changing stuff. I thought of Scrooge and a Christmas Carol saying the spirits had done it all in one night. There was leftover meatloaf in the fridge, and I made a couple of thick sandwiches going heavy on the ketchup. I needed to fuel up because my day was only beginning. I had a lot to do to prepare for tomorrow. 
I would not be going back to school, and my dad might probably would be coming home to an empty house. I was going to try to find the sundial Mr. Bowditch had spoken of. I no longer doubted that it was there, and I no longer doubted it could turn back time for the elderly German shepherd currently snoozing on a rug in the living room. I was sure, less sure that I could get her down those winding steps, and I had no idea how I was supposed to get her 40 or 50, 60 miles to the city. The one thing I was sure of, I couldn't afford to wait. Part 6 of Chapter 12 As I ate, I thought, if I was going to be gone, and with radar, I had to lay a false trail that would lead in some direction other than Mr. Bowditch's house. An idea came to me while I was going out to the garage, and I thought it would serve. It would have to. I got my dad's wheelbarrow on a bonus. On one of the shelves was a bag of calcium hydroxide, more commonly known as quicklime, and model. And why dad, why did dad have that? You guessed it, roaches. Some in our basement, some in the garage. I put the bag in the wheelbarrow that went in the house and showed Rodar, Radar her leash. If I take you to the top of the hill, will you be good? She assured me with her eyes that she would. So I hooked her up and we walked up the first sycamore, me pushing the wheelbarrow and she walking beside it. And Mrs. Richland was back at her usual post and I half expected her to ask what all the rumpus had been about earlier. She didn't just ask if I was planning to do some more work around the place. I said I was. You're very good to do it. I suppose the state will be putting it it up for sale, won't they? Maybe the estate will even pay you, but I wouldn't count on it. Lawyers are stingy. I hope the new owners don't tear it down. It looks so much nicer now. Do you know who's it, who inherited? I said I didn't. Well, if you happen to find out the asking price, let me know. We've been thinking about selling ourselves. We suggested there was, there was Mrs. Richland who knew. I said I would be sure to do that in a pig's eye and roll the wheelbarrow around back with the end of Radar's leash looped over my wrist. The old girl was moving. Well, it wasn't, but it wasn't a particularly long walk up the hill. Miles to the abandoned city, though. She'd make, never make it. Radar was calm at this time, but as soon as I unhooked her leash, she went straight to the sofa bed in the living room and sniffed it over from end to end and laid it down beside it. Laid down beside it. I brought her a bowl of water, then went out to the shed with a bag of quicklime. I shook it over the remains of the roach and watched with some amazement as the case spread up to a sprint. There was a hissing, bubbling sound. Vapor rose from the remains, which would soon be nothing but a puddle of lime slime. I picked up the revolver, took it back into the house, and put it in the safe. I saw a couple of pellets that had rolled away into a corner and dropped them into the bucket with the rest of the gold. When I went downstairs, Radar was fast asleep. Good, I thought. Get all the sleep you can because tomorrow is going to be a busy day for you, girl. This was already a busy one for me. And that was also good. It didn't keep me from thinking about the other world, the red poppies flanking the <coughs> path, the shoe woman with almost no face, the glassy towers of the city, but staying busy probably kept me from having a delayed reaction to my close call with Christopher Polly, and it had been close, very. The little guy hadn't bothered with the stacks of reading matter in the hall, but between the kitchen and the back door in his hunt for gold. I didn't bother with the books, but I spent an hour wheelbarrow on stacks of magazines conveniently to sleep. done up in hay, hay rope out to the shed. I stacked some over the remains of the roach. I piled most of them over near the well of the world. When I went down the next time, when we were went down, I put the stacks on the boards and tried to cover the opening entirely. When I was down, I went back to the house and woke Radar. I gave her a treat from the pantry and walked back down home and walked her back home. I reminded myself to bring her a toy monkey tomorrow. She might want it once we got to where we were going. If that was, she didn't fall up those stairs and pull me with her. She'd go down the stairs at all. When I went and got back, I was I put Polly's twenty two auto, his wallet and some other stuff into my pack. Not much. I'd add some. I'd add more tomorrow for Mr. Bowditch's pantry, and then sat down to write my father. I wanted to put it off, and knew I couldn't afford to. That was a hard letter to write. Dear Dad, you are going to come back to an empty house because I have gone to Chicago with Radar. I found someone on the internet who had an amazing, who has had an amazing success with renewing, with renewing the health and vitality of aging dogs. I've known about this guy for some time, but didn't want to tell you because I know how you feel about. Quack cures. 
Maybe that's what this is. But I can easily afford $750 thanks to my inheritance. I won't tell you not to worry because I know you will, even though there's nothing to worry about. What I will tell you is please don't try to fix your worry with a drink. If I came back and found you were boozing, it would break my heart. Don't try to call me because I'm turning off my phone on or off wouldn't matter where I was going. I will be back. And if this works, I'll be back with a brand new dog. Trust me, Dad. I know what I'm doing. Love, Charlie. Well, I hoped I knew. I put the note in an envelope, wrote Dad on the front, and left it on the kitchen table. Then I opened uh, my laptop and wrote an email to dsylvius at hillviewhigh.edu. It covered much the same territory. I thought if Mrs. S. had been in the room while I was typing, she would have smelled hooky all over me. I set the email to arrive on her office computer Thursday afternoon. Two days of unexplained absence I could get away with, but probably not three. My purpose was to give Dad as much time as his retreat, at his retreat as I could. I could hope Mrs. Sil S. wouldn't call him when she got my email, but I knew she probably would, and he might be headed back then anyway. The real purpose was to tell as many people as possible that I was going to Chicago. To that end, I called the cop shop and asked if Detective Gleason was there. He was. And I asked him if they had any leads in the home invasion at First Sycamore Street. I wanted to ask today because I taken Mr. Borch's dog to Chicago tomorrow. I found someone there who's done wonders with older dogs. Gleason told me there was nothing new, which was what I expected. I had uh, taken care of the home invader myself, or so I, I hoped. Gleason wished me good luck with the old pooch. That was a wish I took to heart. Part 7 of Chapter 12. That evening, I tucked three more of the new pills into Radar's chow. I would give her three more tomorrow. There weren't many were left in the bottle, but maybe that was okay. I didn't know for sure what they were, but I had an idea they were doggy speed. They were shortening her life at the same time they were peppering her up. I told myself I just had to get her down the steps, and after that, well, I didn't know, what, know after that. My phone was working again, although I had to, was working again, although I, I had to do a hard reset to get it to show the right time, and around 7 o'clock it rang. Dad was in the window. I turned on the TV and jacked the volume a little before answering it. Hey, Charlie, everything okay? It's fine. Climb any trees? He laughed. No trees. It's raining up here. A lot of rah-rah team spirit instead. Insurance guy's gone wild. What are you do watching, Sports Center? Dog okay? Rage? She looked up from her rug. She's good. Still eating? Every bite of her dinner and licked the bowl. Glad to hear it. We talked a little more. He seemed unworried, so I guess I was putting on a good front. That made me glad and ashamed at the same time. I'll give you a call tomorrow if you want. Nah, I might go out for burgers and mini golf with a bunch of guys. And girls? Well, there might be girls present. I'll call you if something happens. Like the house cut she's on fire. It sounds like a plan. Sleep well, Chip. You too. From where I was sitting, I could see the letter on the kitchen table. I didn't like sleeping. I didn't like lying to my dad, but I didn't see any other choice. It was an extraordinary situation. I killed the TV and got ready to turn in at 8 o'clock for the first time since forever, but I was planning on rising early, as soon as, uh, soon as begun, soon as done, my mother used to say. Sometimes I couldn't exactly remember what she looked like without checking her picture, but I could remember all her little sayings. The mind is a weird machine. I looked up, but not because I was afraid of Polly. He probably knew where I lived, but he had two broken hands and I had his gun. He was also without money and ID. My guess was that he was already hitching to what he called Chai, where he'd uh, try to turn those four gold pellets into cash. If he was able to sell them at all, I thought he'd get no more than 20 cents on the dollar, and that was all right with me. Awesome sauce. Every time I started to feel sorry for him or guilty about what I'd done, I thought of him pressing the barrel of his little gun against my, the back of my head, telling me not to turn around. It wouldn't be smart. I was glad I didn't kill him, though. That was that. There was that. I examined myself closer, closely in the mirror as I brushed my teeth. I thought I looked the same as ever, which was sort of amazing after everything that had happened. I rinsed out my mouth, turned, and saw Radar sitting in the bathroom doorway. I bent and, <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. I bent and ruffled the fur at the side of her face. You want to go on adventures tomorrow, girl? 
She thumped her tail, then went into the guest room and lay down at the foot of my bed. I, dub I double-checked my alarm to make sure it was set for 5 a.m., then turned off the light. I expected it would take my me a long time to go to sleep after the day's roller coaster ride, but I started to drift almost at once. I asked myself if I was really going to risk my life and certainly get into a boatload of trouble, both with my dad and at school. For an old dog who had already had in canine years a, a good run, the answer seemed to be yes, but that wasn't all. It was the wonder of the thing, the mystery of it. I had found another world for God's sake. I had wanted to see the city with uh, green tow the green towers and find out if it really was Oz, not o only with a terrible monster, Gog Magog, at its heart instead of a humbug projecting his voice from behind a curtain. I wanted to find the sundial and see if it actually did what Mr. Bowditch said it did. And you have to remember, I was 17, a prime age of both adventuring and foolish decisions. But yeah, mostly it was the dog I loved her, you see, and I didn't want to let her go. I rolled over on my side and went to sleep. And we're going to start there for today. We're, that's the end of chapter 12. Excuse me. That's the end of chapter 12. And in the next video, we will get into call... Chapter 13, Calling Andy, Radar Decides, Stu Goober. And you have a good night. You have it. stay safe and healthy. You try to stay cool in this heat. I know I am. Have a great night.